Hello, my name is Brian Hazeltine. Uh, I am a uh, adjunct professor at Cornerstone University these days, but I've been involved with K-12 education for um, over 40 years. And uh, before that, as a student in uh, a variety of different settings, uh, private schools, public schools, secular schools, Christian schools, day schools, boarding schools, single, single gender schools and mixed schools, ability group schools, online schools, seminary, Bible college, community college, virtually every educational institution known to man. I've, I've uh, been a principal of a school that operated in a basement of a farmhouse in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. And uh, I attended one of the most expensive schools in the world in the Alps of Switzerland, and I've seen everything in between. And over those 40 years, I have seen a lot of different efforts to uh, make changes to education, uh, to try different strategies, implement new ideas, and a lot of them really don't make a lot of difference. And so it was a number of years ago I came across this book, and I actually started to develop a presentation then, but just never got around to finishing it. And since I recently retired from K-12 administration, I thought this would be a good time to uh, take another look at this and see if I can't pull something together that would uh, summarize the findings of Tony Frontier and James Rickabaugh. They wrote a book, and probably the title is going to be reversed for you here, but it's called uh, Five Levers to Improve Learning. And the subtitle is How to Prioritize for Powerful Results in Your School. It's not a particularly uh, big book, as you can see. Uh, it's published by um, Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, so worth purchasing if you get a chance to, uh, to do that. But if not, this short summary uh, may give you an idea of the content and spur your thinking somewhat. So uh, here's, uh, here's basically a summary of what the book has to say. Uh, the key idea is that there's a lot of innovation out there that doesn't really produce a lot of results. And if we're going to be effective as administrators and board members and educators, we should focus our efforts on, on those changes that have the greatest promise of bringing good results. We want to align our direction and all of our energies uh, and towards the results we want to achieve and plan towards that. Now, a lot of planning goes into school every single year. Some of that planning is status quo planning. Perhaps you're happy with the bus, um, bus program that you have in place. You just need to change a few stops, maybe adjust the timing a little bit. But basically, uh, you know, everything is going to be fine. Maybe you change the, uh, you know, the shop where you get your repairs done. Maybe you add a driver. Maybe you add a new bus or whatever. But essentially, the planning is around continuing to do the same kinds of things uh, with the same people and the same results. Uh, that's status quo, and uh, then there's transactional and transformational change. I'll talk about each of these uh, briefly as we get to it. So uh, if you like the current system you're using, you like the results that you're getting, then there's no change needed. It's just tweaking around the edges. Uh, continue on as you have. Uh, most people are not satisfied with everything as it is, but some things are working fine, so there's no need to change something if it's working well. A transactional change are a lot of the changes that we tend to focus on. Um, we use uh, the same people, the same systems. We often get the same results, so we're tweaking around the edges. So maybe we change the, um, you know, the class size. Maybe we change the textbook. Maybe we uh, have a new curriculum and the schedule is changed around, or a new person comes in and those kinds of things, but they don't really change what's going on in the classroom and how we think about learning and what is going on in the teaching learning process. That thinking leads us to the kind of change that really is transformational. Um, this is going to require new skills, new thinking, new ideas, and probably should have new results. And we should be looking for new results. If you don't want to change the results, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you want different results, then you've got to do different things. And so an example would be developing an online school where one didn't exist before. This is a very different way of doing education. So uh, may require a different skill set, different processes, uh, different ways of doing things. So that's a major one. Uh, School-wide instructional strategies so that teachers are doing different things in the classroom with students in order to bring about different results. Uh, staff peer assessment, for example, instead of the 
uh, principal uh, evaluating everybody on staff, the staff evaluate one another. Those are radically different uh, systems than we typically have in place, and it's going to take some new thinking and new ways of doing things. Transformational changes are the things that we need to do to get really different results. So uh, Fortier and Ricaba suggest that there are five major levers that we have available to us. And these are structure, sample, standards, strategy, and self. Structure is the overall design of the buildings and features to it. Sample, who are we teaching? What is the group's standards? What are the objectives that we're shooting for? Strategies, what do teachers do on Monday morning to cause learning to happen? And self, meaning what's going on in the mind of the student. We're going to look at each one of these individually. So structure. So what if we had a smaller school? What if we had a bigger school? How would that change things? There's certainly things you can do when a school is small that you can't do when it's big. You don't have the flexibility. On the other hand, a big school can do things that a small school can't because they've got the resources and the specialist teachers. Uh, what about class size? Maybe if we had smaller classes, maybe if we had bigger classes, maybe if we team taught those classes. Uh, what about block versus traditional uh, scheduling? A one-to-one -one tech versus the computer lab. What if we were to change the entire governance of the school? So instead of a public school, we go to a private school or, or it's a charter school, some sort of change at the top. What if we have a magnet school that's really designed around a particular theme and we allow parents to choose with vouchers uh, which school their child will attend? Maybe we just need to have more seat time. Kids need to be in class longer. We need to cut back on art and music and lengthen the day and lengthen the year because these are the things that are being done in some other places that you know maybe might help. And while intuitively we can suggest that those things might make an improvement, they actually don't. A lot of money gets invested in making these kinds of changes, but the end result is very much the same. So it's a lot of time, energy, effort, money, spent on designing buildings and systems and processes that don't actually change learning outcomes for students in the classroom. So let's move on. What about the sample? Maybe if we just grouped all the guys together and all the girls together, uh, then we would get different outcomes. I went to an all-boys school for uh, a couple of years in Switzerland, and eventually they decided that it would be smarter to integrate, and they brought girls in, and it was a big deal for, uh, you know, for the school at the time, and now it's just considered normal. Uh, we've tried to set off, uh, you know, girls' schools as well, uh, that maybe because they learn differently and we can design it. But in the end, nothing really changes. Maybe we need to group students and, and teachers uh, into ability groups. So we have gifted students in one room and average students here and then remedial students there. And intuitively, that makes so much sense, but it doesn't really change things. Maybe we have to have, uh, you know, honors programs and regular programs and have different tracks and levels for different students. And again, the end result is not much different. Multi-age classes. So I've taught um, two grade splits, three grade splits, five grade splits. I've taught the grades three through 12 in one room. That was the farmhouse in Alberta I mentioned. Um, Yes, and, and you can do it, and you can get good results, but not necessarily any better than doing it any differently. Maybe we need to have single-grade classrooms. That was going to be the answer to the one-room schoolhouse back around the turn of the last century. But uh, again, nothing has changed radically. Retention and acceleration. Retention has a um, bad track record, in all honesty. It uh, doesn't seem to produce a lot of results. Um, I argue that it's usually because it's done too late. If you're going to retain, do it at kindergarten or maybe at second grade. But other than that, never do that. Uh, the results are pretty bad. Acceleration, however, does produce some good results. So that's something you can do if it's, you have a gifted student rather than a gifted program. Move them up a grade. That'll keep them moving and keep them challenged. But again, structure and sample changes don't really change the end results. Standards hold out more promise, okay? So there's been a lot of work in recent years. Um, Common Core was an obvious one that came up and then has kind of gone by the wayside. But the idea was that we set international standards for schools across the country and states came together and said, yes, we need to raise the, uh, the standard of learning in the country. And there's some, uh, uh, some sense in which this has some possibility. For example, when fuel efficiency standards were increased in the United States, 
companies had to come up with new technologies, new systems for building cars to meet those standards. So it can be a driver. Um, but what's happened in schools is nothing changes. We just try to work harder rather than working smarter. We're not coming up with new ways of teaching to meet those standards. And that's what has to happen. Uh, simply m having more standards, adding on. So we have 100 standards. If 100 is good, 150 must be better. And uh, prioritizing the standards, we focus on this, then we focus on that. And none of these are bad in and of themselves, but they don't produce the results we want unless they're linked together with some other things that come. But they do give a vision for what it is we want to achieve, and that's a starting point. So uh, when we get to looking at standards, we now have something that has some moderate effect, positive effect on learning, if it is more than simply, oh, we went through the curriculum and we changed the page numbers and we changed, you know, the uh, alignment of our courses to the new standards. So now it all aligns, but we haven't changed anything that's going on in the classroom. OK, and so that kind of alignment is not helpful. But if we think about what the standards are trying to accomplish and the objectives of those standards, then real change of learning can happen and we can see results uh, that are very positive. So uh, the key there is linking those standards to the teaching. So now we are teaching intentionally to meet the objectives of those standards. And again, not simply that we have taught the standards, but that students are in fact achieving the standards. Uh, long ago, I heard um, uh, Neil Postman who made a comment that nothing has been taught until something has been learned and the idea is that if if the student didn't learn it then you didn't teach it well you didn't teach it appropriately you didn't teach it effectively it's like saying uh, you know you've heard teachers say oh i taught it five times but they didn't learn it well i can't sell you something if you didn't buy it if we see uh, teaching as a transaction between the teacher and the student where the teacher is trying to cause learning to happen in the student, then it's all about what's going on with the student, not about what's going on with the teacher. Did you make the sale? Did the learning happen? And so the teaching has to be linked to the standard in order to get the learning to happen for the student to achieve that standard. And the testing and assessments that we do at the end should also be linked to that standard to say whether the student in fact has achieved it, not whether they completed the activity properly. It's not about the activities that they do. It is about the standards that those activities are designed to accomplish. It's the end goal of those activities that we should be looking at very carefully. And, uh, and again, the students need to be engaged in that process and involved in that process and thinking about it. They should know what the standard is. They should know what the expectations are. Too often rubrics, for example, are designed to assess the student when in fact a rubric should be used to guide the student. Uh, we don't need to give them all the five categories of the rubric. Just give them the top one. What does good writing look like? What does uh, a good project look like? What are the qualities of really well done ones? This is what we're shooting for. And they can use those rubrics to self-assess and, and they can be used for formative assessment. Uh, that's much more valuable than using them for uh, final uh, assessment. Okay, so standards gets us into something that has some positive uh, possibilities for impact if we link our teaching and our assessments and our activities to those standards. This is, in my mind, is really the heart of it, although the authors would argue that the uh, next section is even more important. They don't provide as much evidence for that as I would like. This, however, is very thoroughly researched and supported uh, from uh, many, many studies. What goes on in the classroom is the single most important thing that impacts student learning. And intuitively, that makes sense. Uh, anything we do at the building level, the governance level, is not going to directly impact students the way teachers can impact students. So the heart of education is what happens between the teacher and the student. And so uh, we need to be focused on student learning and thinking rather than teacher instruction. So the focus needs to be on student learning. Uh, we should be basing our strategies on what the research tells us. So um, some of these are basic, you know, building on prior understanding. What do we already know? Uh, assessing that and building on that 
step by step sequentially. There needs to be a balance of facts and conceptual understanding. It can't all be just rote memory of facts, but rote memory of facts is important. I really don't want a first grade student or a kindergartner leaving kindergarten without knowing all 26 letters of the alphabet, okay? Uh, a conceptual understanding that there are squiggles that make sounds is not adequate. They actually need to know all of those letters. And so the same with addition facts and whatever. There's a lot of factual understanding that students need in order to develop conceptual understanding. Without the factual knowledge basis, they won't get to the higher learning. So higher learning skills uh, come when they're built on a foundation of accurate knowledge. So with that truth about how the world works, then we can understand um, more complex uh, relationships between things in the world. We can do analysis of the component parts. We can synthesize from disparate um, areas things that could be put together in a new and unique way. And we can evaluate what is good and what is not good because we have that um, factual basis and foundation uh, for knowledge and for that evaluation. So uh, creative thinking is good, but it has to be creative thinking built on top of uh, sound, factual knowledge. Uh, part of that, uh, this process should encourage metacognition. So this is thinking about thinking, getting students to self-assess. So how, how did you do here? How, how closely do you think you came to meeting the objective of the standard? What do you need to work on now? What are you finding frustrating? What is complex? What is easy? What do you think you've mastered? So getting students to think about the standards and how they meet up with those standards and where they need uh, help and targeted feedback, helping them to see that, uh, yes, you did great here. You did really well there. You need to work on this. This seems to be an issue. So talk to me about how you're doing. And so you're thinking about the process and the students are actively involved. Those kinds of strategies pay very big different dividends. Um, then we want to leverage what we would call the key inputs, that what happens in the classroom is a direct function of the teacher and their personal characteristics. They need to be organized. They need to be empathetic. They need to be understanding. They have to have a, a sense of humor, be able to relate well to the students that they teach, but also maintain order and uh, have that balance of firmness and flexibility, those kinds of things that uh, create for a warm uh, but academically rigorous classroom. So you can have both that, uh, you know, kindness and flexibility, but also structure and routine. So it's all important. Quality curriculum, it does matter what textbooks you use. It does matter, you know, what your objectives are. It does matter if you're teaching the same thing five different times in a row with slight differences, as opposed to moving on to greater and greater complexity and depth. So a good curriculum is important. And then quality instruction. We know from the work of Hattie and Marzano that there are strategies teachers can use that do make a difference. There are some um, strategies that are more effective than others. So we want to focus on those most important strategies, those most effective strategies. That doesn't mean that we only uh, emphasize note taking and summarizing as, as one of the effective strategies that Marzano found. It doesn't mean that we always allow for student autonomy and choice, but we're cognizant of those. Teachers need to have a deep, large toolkit and have uh, the knowledge of what to use when. I like uh, Marzano's more recent work. Um, some of that earlier stuff came from classroom instruction that works, but uh, more recently he has uh, written The Art and Science of Teaching, and it's, there's a second edition out now. And I, I love that concept because teaching truly is part science and part art. And so there are strategies that have proven to be more effective than others, and good teachers will use those. But the artist teacher understands which strategy to use with what concept, with what classroom, on which day. And, and there's, those are things that are very difficult to teach. Uh, a lot of it comes with experience, uh, but also uh, by getting feedback and being observed by other teachers and having the opportunity to discuss uh, teaching strategies, providing professional development for teachers that focus on strategies and focus on standards, focus on linking strategies to those standards and linking assessment to those standards. Uh, there needs to be really intentional, thoughtful, professional development uh, where teachers are free to work on their craft 
And uh, in recent years, we've moved away from the, uh, you know, the quick fix, send teachers to a convention and everything will be wonderful. And, and as much as I enjoy those conventions as well, they haven't really impacted what happens in the classroom. And we have a wealth of material out there now from Hattie and Marzano, Doug Lamov as well, Teach Like a Champion. So, so the strategies are available, but expertise only comes with time and practice. And expertise comes with expert instruction. And so providing teachers with coaches and, and others who can come alongside and work with them to refine their craft and refine the implementation of specific strategies. Uh, these are uh, plans and approaches and levers that we can use that really will pay off because this is the heart of learning. The heart of uh, uh, the classroom is the instructional strategies. All right. And then lastly, uh, they talk about self. And uh, with that, they're talking about the student being able to self-regulate, to have some self-discipline, uh, to know when they're tired, know when they're anxious, to uh, make changes, whether it's getting up, moving about, and those kinds of things. Uh, helping them to find things that, that are of interest to them, that will motivate them, and that appropriate level of challenge. It's not too challenging so that it's not overwhelming, but you don't want it so simple that it's boring. And so providing work and opportunities that are relevant and appropriate challenge, getting students engaged in the process so they're doing, so it's not just listening. Uh, one thing to uh, tell a story about a hockey game, another thing to have students, you know, predict to which um, team will win given certain characteristics. So getting them engaged and in, in doing it and uh, bringing them to that level of self-efficacy where they they know they can learn, they can grow if they continue to per persevere and developing in them that um, growth mindset rather than a static one that says, well, I'm just born this way or I can't or and, and, and when they're so willing to give up too soon, but helping them to realize, hey, you were better than before and helping them to compare where they were before to where they are now. And so they can see the growth and that ho gives hope and promise of things to come. And eventually we want them to get uh, some ownership of the learning. So that's providing some choice. Uh, sometimes that's a choice of three things that the teacher develops. Sometimes it can be a choice of um, many different things. Maybe there's 10 things students can choose. Uh, you know, they just need to choose two out of the 10. So they have a wider choice. But also it can be where students um, are given the option to, to what would they like to do? Uh, how would they do it? And um, you know, getting the student input. I, I remember a student who um, was a great writer and um, I just got tired of giving A's out to the student for two and three page essays. So I said, just to skip all these other activities. Why don't we work on a short story? Left the topic completely up to her. And she developed a wonderful story about the birth of Moses as told from the perspective of Miriam who was praying, oh God, you know, let it be a girl. Don't let it be a boy because she didn't want to... Um, Pharaoh to to take the baby and kill it. Now, uh, very precocious and, and uh, uh, insightful for an eighth grade student, and she did a great job. Eventually, we got it published in Focus on the Family Clubhouse magazine, and she gets royalties for that even to this day, as far as I know. And so, but she took ownership, and, and it became part of who she uh, was and wanted to learn. And eventually we're, we're trying to work ourselves out of jobs, right? As teachers, we want our students to become independent learners who are not dependent on our direction and our assessments, but they know what they want. They know how to get there. They know how to ask questions. They know how to do research. Sadly, I, I work with graduate students who can't do some of that. They, they don't follow directions. They don't ask questions. They, they are passive and they haven't taken ownership of their own le learning. Uh, but uh, this is the goal. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the authors believe that this is the most important area, and it certainly is important, but I have to say that they didn't provide the evidence for that claim that this is more important than the strategies. And so I, I have a question mark about that. Certainly is important, certainly something we should be working on, and engaged, motivated students are going to do better than ones who are not. We know that. But I would suggest that the heart of all of this is the strategy. Because teachers who have mastered the art and science of teaching pull strategies together. They select from their toolbox those things which, in fact, meet the objectives of the standards. They will pull out assessments that meet the objectives of the standards. 
and they will do so in ways that engage and motivate students. So I focus in on the on the teaching strategies because to me that has the best hope of pulling standards, strategies, and self together. When the teacher works on the appropriate strategy, she can be mindful, should be mindful of the standards that are required and the objectives that she needs to be achieving, but also um, the kinds of students that she's working with and um, what they need, what they're interested in, where they're weak, where they're strong, and the kinds of feedback they need and the kinds of uh, projects that would be of interest to them that would develop self-efficacy, motivation, engagement, uh, independent learning. So um, that would be my thought. In summary, uh, the authors have uh, looked at five different levers or levers of uh, school improvement, and they found that the first two, structure and sample, have low effect, standards, moderate effect, but can be more significant if they're followed up with strategies that are really intentionally linking instructional activities to those standards. And then finally, uh, the strategies in the classroom have a very high effect on learning and learning outcomes, along with the motivation and engagement of the student. I highly recommend the book, Five Levers to Improve Learning, How to Prioritize for Powerful Results in Your School by Tony Frontier and James Rickabaugh. Uh, and I just wanted to take this uh, short time to share that with you. And hopefully uh, that will spur you on to further thinking about this. Thank you.